Occasionally, when you collect medical devices and early Tesla coils, you find a machine that doesn't really look that special, and then you plug it in and it just blows your socks off. Uh, this is one of those machines. It's a uh, Type H Tesla coil made by H.G. Fisher. It was originally sold as a shelf mount dental x-ray machine. And as technologies changed by the 1930s, it was then sold as sort of a a laboratory or demonstration Tesla coil by Central Scientific or Senco in Chicago. Uh, it's one of the most impressive Tesla coils we've seen and it's one of the most efficient. Uh, you can see uh, in the, the panel is very simple, it's just an on off switch, a knife switch. Uh, there's a single spark gap and there's a, a set of rotary switches to adjust how much current goes through the machine on high power it consumes 15 amps. Uh, there's also an addition of an unusual magnetic circuit inside that lowers the capacity of uh, the output if it was if you wanted just minute sparks. In the early days it was used for violet ray treatments. Um, it's just used to tame the spark as far as Tesla experiments go. But what's unusual about it, it's actually an iron core coil combined with an adjustable cap. Um, the capacitor on the first three buttons is 0.1 microfarad and then a certain percentage of this tapped coil is, is put in the circuit. On the, the last button it's 0.6 microfarads and none of the magnetic coils involved. So it's kind of an unusual way of adjusting the frequency. But on the lowest frequency setting it's the most impressive. Surprisingly, the H.G. Fisher Company only recently went out of business, and before they did, they left us their archive of blueprints, and we were lucky enough to get the most important blueprint to this machine. This is actually the pancake coils that are in the top of the machine. And what's most striking about these coils are the number of windings in each secondary coil. It starts off with 26 gauge wire it's soldered to the center post of each coil and there are roughly 70 turns a layer put on for 23 layers that ends up being 1600 turns of wire and then to the end of that soldered a number 28 gauge wire and then another 87 turns per layer are wound until an additional 2000 turns are put on each secondary coil so that means that each coil, each secondary coil, has 3,600 turns of wire in this machine. And that's unheard of in, in Tesla coiling. Um, you, normally you have a, a few thousand turns at most. So uh, this system has a complete 7,200 turns of wire in the, the bipolar secondary coils, um, making it one of the lowest frequency coils marketed. And you'll see, though, with these low frequencies, you can, you're able to use a very large capacitor and, and get very high efficiencies from a relatively simple system. Uh, the primary coils, uh, it called out for uh, 24 and 3 quarter turns of 18 gauge stranded wire in each coil. So it's a very, very low frequency when you take into consideration 0.6 microfarads. Uh, condenser with so many turns on the primary. Um, it's probably operating less than 50 kilohertz. On the lowest power setting of this machine, uh, it would be difficult to tell whether this was a static machine or a large induction coil. The spark really doesn't appear to be anything from a Tesla coil. This may wreck complete havoc with the computer, but you'll be able to see the sparks a little bit better here. When 
you see these sparks to the naked eye, there's actually, they're purple, but you also see little specks of orange coming from the brass electrodes that I have here. Now these aren't the original electrodes, but I, I just made them uh, uh, to have something on the top of the machine. But you can actually see bits of the metal being stripped away as a discharge occurs. It's a pretty fierce discharge coming out for a low power. I'm going to close the gap on increasing each button because the main transformer in this is only a thousand volts and because of that uh, the normal magnetic reactance coil that's in there uh, you may have to adjust the gap settings or the voltage as you're putting in or limiting the current to the transformer. the second power setting, we'll move to the third. Now, what's interesting about this, I'm seeing about an inch of orange uh, just with the naked eye when you see this discharge occurring coming from each terminal. So it's it's taking off quite a bit of, of metal, metal particles as, as the sparks occurring. Um, you'll also see that the sparks waving around, but the voltage in the system is, is rated much more than this uh, seven or eight inch gap on top of the machine. It's um, uh, Who knows what the real spark length of these coils were if they'd be separated. It might spark a foot or 16 inches or more. But um, for the application involved, which was x-rays, they had to limit the gap uh, uh, on top just because you, there was only a, a useful voltage range that you could actually use to, to make uh, especially dental x-rays. Um, the higher the voltage, the more penetrating they are, so it wasn't needed for the application. But uh, definitely, if this is bridging the gap even on the lowest power setting, you can imagine uh, and it's bridging the gap with ease, uh, there's no problems at all. You can imagine uh, that this coil probably will spark a lot farther than you're seeing here. This is now the fourth power setting, which is uh, roughly in the, the middle of things. Even on this power setting, I'm starting to see a flaming arc, um, and we still have two buttons to go before we reach high power. This is next to the highest power set. I may have to turn off the ceiling fan to better appreciate this because uh, the fan's blowing the arc around. But definitely you can see the, the flaming arc already with this. It's a, a lot of current coming out. At night you really can see the colors. Uh, it's um, almost like a fire when you're, when you, all you can see is the discharge itself. Now you can really see the flaming arc without the fan blowing it around. And this is the scariest, this is the highest power setting.
Now, the heat from mm -hmm. this discharge can be felt all around the machine. To the naked eye, it's <coughs> roughly pink or orange or yellow. Uh, there's very little purple in it when you see it up close. And you can see almost ribbons of, of flames twisting around as it goes between the terminals. Uh, definitely an impressive machine. Um, one of the most efficient we've operated. We've taken the pancake coils out of this and operated it with as, as little as 40 watts of power from a small kicking coil, almost like a violet ray machine. And we've been able to get five inch sparks from that. And we know from Tesla's lectures, he was getting six inch sparks from 30 watts of power. So it's very close in efficiency to what Tesla himself was doing. Whether the parameters were the same, I don't know. But definitely, it's a very, very efficient machine. It's very unusual. Um, like some of Kinraid's work, it's, it's very extreme as far as the parameters are concerned. But definitely a, an amazing machine. And it really shows a side of high frequency most people don't really get to see. Um, these low frequency coils were, were really something to witness up close. And this type of coil, uh, it was or these lower frequencies were commonly used in wireless telegraphy. So in the early days of, of wireless use, the, and this is something Tesla points out, and especially like the Marconi trials, um, above certain frequencies, wireless became kind of more and more impractical. You needed more and more power levels. And Tesla was pointing out that, hey, if you work around 50 kilohertz, uh, it works a lot better. And not many people listen to that, but uh, we do know that these machines were used experimentally by some radio people to try and experiment with uh, wireless or telegraphy. So, uh, as a, a scientific demonstration device, it's a shame that they're not in schools anymore because I think this would have gotten everyone's attention in physics class. Um, there's not many of them around. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times in schools they get stored in chemistry labs and parts get corroded and falling apart because uh, of uh, nickel plating and so forth on the machines reacting with some of the chemicals. Um, a lot of schools throw them out over the years and it's a real shame. It's, uh, there are floor model versions of, the, of this machine that were sold for x-ray use. They're very, very scarce. Uh, it's basically the same components but a little bit more elaborate case and uh, some porcelain insulators and copper balls on top. Um, a little bit of top load capacity on these coils and, and the discharge will blow up 16 inches or more on high power. It it's really gets scary. Um, but really impressive Tesla coil. Uh, kind of plain, almost ugly in appearance. The case is this uh, really um, not as elaborate as most machines you see from that time period. But electrically, it's amazing. It's hard to talk about the H.G. Fisher company and not get off the topic of spark gap Tesla coils because they were so impressive when they come out of that company. But Fisher made a lot of really interesting products. And this is one of the best engineers I've seen in low voltage machines. This is a wave generator made by Fisher. And in reality, it's a low voltage motor generator set that has a set of commutators and resistances inside that actually make different waveforms. And this was used for therapy, for muscle stimulation and rehabilitation. But you can see the machine itself is, is extremely simple. It's very small. But if I remove the back panel, you can see that by just changing a few switches, you can get a variety of galvanic, pulsed galvanic, 
and sinusoidal currents coming out of the machine. And what's remarkable is that these currents are all finely controlled and they're very precisely made mechanically inside this machine. So you can see the motor generators here <coughs> and to the right you can see a, a series of, of resistances and in front of that is a, a copper plate with a set of brushes that rotate on the plate and what these brushes do are add more and less resistance to the circuit so as it's spinning you're actually tracing the waveforms going up and down on the other side of the machine you have a, a speed control and this actually controls the frequency I turn it on see the generator starts working and by adjusting this knob the frequency can be increased or decreased in the output of the machine So I go to the edge, it turns quicker, and if I move it inside, the surges become slower and slower. You can kind of see these patterns being traced right now. There's also a large resistor in the front of the machine that actually regulates the output of the current. And there are a couple of meters showing uh, voltage and amperage, milliamperage in this case. And just by setting these switches, 1, 2, 3, and A, B, C, D, E, you can get all of the waveforms shown on the back of this casting. Those are remarkably well-engineered machine, very simple to operate for a, a physician or a, a nurse. Um, these currents were applied to the body in the same way that TENS units or muscle stimulators are, are today. There's various electrodes. These were sponge. Typically they were wetted in like an alkaline solution or salt water and placed on various motor points and the muscles would, would start moving. They had very direct application electrodes for hitting specific motor points. And they were also used in a rehabilitative sense with the typical pads that you'd see today, especially if you go to like a chiropractor uh, and you'll receive these treatments. Uh, it was also used for minor surgery, the galvanic side of things, electrolysis, things like that. You had the DC output, pure, coming straight from the generator if you wanted that. So Fisher low voltage machine, there's no spark gap, there's no weed and ball, there's no uh, output throwing sparks anywhere, but still a very impressive machine. Very well engineered. You can see some of the multitudes of waveforms they're talking about and what function it would have for the, for the doctor. Uh, there were a lot of uh, com competition for these types of machines um, in their time period. Of course today these machines are about this big, all done with solid state. Um, I question if if, uh, if the solid state's really as accurate as this machine, because literally the waveforms are, are uh, generated in front of your eyes. You can see exactly how these resistances are thrown in. It's very, very precise. Um, I'm sure solid state can come close to that and not weigh 200 pounds like this one, but... Uh, Definitely a brilliant piece of engineering and a lot of components, a lot of time went into making this machine. Um, it's a, an engineering feat to a certain extent because uh, it's very small, it's very compact, and yet you have all of these distinct modalities coming out of it. Um, very good piece of engineering from H.G. Fisher and very elegant too. Uh, super kind of art deco design, late 30s. Um, Real pretty, great machine for any collection. 
some of the remarkable things I have from the Fisher Archive uh, regarding the low voltage machine. Uh, these are 11 by 17 blueprints, original hand drawn. You can see the resistance wire that could be seen on the side of that machine and the exact specifications to that. how to wind that coil even down to fractional turns so mention that these things are were precisely made and with the blueprints you can really see how much care was taken if I continue on you can see the the rotating assembly inside the machine that was kind of hard to see from from this angle uh, here's the actual blueprints detailing what all of these plates meant, how they were attached to that former resistance coil in that blueprint. It's very, very elaborate. Wave commutator, 54 segments. Dwell wave commutator, 54 segments. So depending how this was switched, uh, you could have either a, a, a direct wave or um, a wave with surges, let's say. You can see some of the, the worm gear assembly on the motor generator. And even the elaborate assembly that controls the resistance coil just by turning a, wi or a knob on the front of the panel. Um, you have this sweeping motion across the, the resistance and that controls, limits the current to the output to the patient. And then there are a series of, of blueprints just on connections and basic parts, piece parts to the machine. We have many stacks of those as well. I can outline just a few And this this represents a stack of several hundred. I mean, these are only a few thousandths, uh, not even a thousandth of an inch thick. This old vellum. Um, you can see the friction disc and shaft assembly. And this is what we saw when I changed the frequency on the left side of the machine. See different bearing assemblies. But all of these blueprints re represent small parts, piece parts that would have had to have been made. And this is just a fraction of the number of blueprints that the whole machine took to make. One of the companies Fisher was in competition with was the McIntosh Electric Corporation, formerly McIntosh Battery and Optic Company. Now this was a company that made wave generators before H.G. Fisher even existed. Um, this is kind of a 1930s version of their earliest machine, the McIntosh PolySign. And it was in competition with the low voltage machine we just saw. And mechanically, it's, it's similar, but not exact. And a lot of times, these different waveforms, the, the way they were generated was patented. And uh, the companies had to avoid each other's patents, and they did little clever adjustments here and there. And sometimes the machines had a little bit uh, different range uh, from each other and these were used later as ways of promoting one machine over the other. So there's a very simple switch to the left which controls all the waveforms. They're all drawn out here in the same way as the Fisher. And it goes from galvanic to different types of pulsed galvanic and sinusoidal waves. Um, McIntosh actually names out all the different waves. There's a way of adjusting the current and the voltage from these in a similar way as the Fisher machine, but, but just done a little bit differently. Um, beautiful machine, it, it's very heavy. This is all enameled cast iron. It looks like porcelain, but it weighs a few hundred pounds. And they even had an electrode holder, uh, warmer in the top drawer that could be attached to the side of the machine so that you didn't have cold electrodes being placed on the patient. Uh, that was something that became standard with the Morse Wave Generator, which is yet another machine that was in competition with both companies again. So, this is an, an example of similar engineering, just from a different company. 
um, slightly different waveforms produced, but very similar inside mechanically. For the last part of this video, I'll show something kind of simple, but historically pretty, pretty neat. It's uh, nothing more than a neon transformer, exteriorly. But uh, the history of this, as it goes, it was listed on eBay. It was, it's a 15,000 volt, 120 milliamp, which is uh, one of the highest uh, current neons and voltage that was sold for a standard 110 volt line. Uh, it was made sometime during the 40s or 50s. Uh, it was owned previously by Kenneth Strickfad, the, the great special effects man of Universal Studios that did all the Frankenstein films, more than 100 films. Um, we already have some personal items of him that were given to us by Bill Wysock. And this was a transformer that was given to a young man uh, involved in, in different audio related things in California. Uh, he met Ken as a kid and, and Ken gave him this to make of Jacob's Ladder. And uh, this next video is this transformer being used as a Jacob's Ladder. And even though it's 15,000 volts, you see this massive arc coming off of it. And it shows something very dangerous that when you have high voltage, even if it's not very high, once you have current involved, it can, uh, once the arc is established, it can grow and grow and grow and expand out and become very dangerous. It's the main problem with down power lines because it's a, a similar voltage to this, only a lot more current. And that's why you have these, these wires are able to arc for, for several feet away once the initial arc is established. So it's kind of a, a wake up for anyone involved with high voltage. Uh, uh, after a while, you may get ca casual, uh, uh, foolishly, with high voltages. You start working with higher and higher voltages, but uh, it's good never to forget that it's all, it's all deadly, it's all dangerous, and uh, this next video is, is pretty scary, and I have to thank a friend of mine, Frank Jones, for, for buying this and sending it my way. It was a, a surprise uh, auction that showed up on eBay, and historically very significant, because anything of Ken's is a considered a treasure by everyone in the Tesla community.